This podcast is recorded on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Coquitlam peoples. British Columbia, I've seen your mountains high, seen your pretty rainbows and your blue crystal skies, watched your winding rivers as they flow around the bend. To me, you're not a stranger, you'll always be a friend. Coming to you from the West Coast, this is Politicos. Today is September 13th, 2024. I'm Ian Bushfield, and today I'm joined by Jen St. Dennis, reporter with the TIE. Hi, Jen. Hello, Ian. Welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Yeah, it's great to be back. It's been a while. I think we had you on Canby Report. Have you been on this show before? Uh, I think just Canby Report. Yeah, but it's yeah, I don't think I've been on this You've show. You've around so. a few times. You've been at the Tai though for a little while now, right? Yeah, that's right. I've been at the Tai now since 2020. So and you're covered. Yeah, it's Jeez, a- time flies. <laughs> We're all in a time loop. Like it doesn't seem like four years has gone by, but it has. <laughs> and your role there, you've been covering the election, correct? Yeah, uh, we've really put a lot of energy into covering this election. And we actually did a big fundraising drive, kind of putting to our readers, you know, that this election, um, both the provincial and probably the federal election that's probably going to be coming soon, um, are kind of unusual. We're seeing, you know, a lot of like, we're obviously seeing these resurgent conservative movements, but we're seeing a lot of tactics that kind of seem similar to what's happening in the States. And so we kind of put it to our readers that we wanted to really closely follow those trends. And they responded in this huge way. We got like tons of fundraising from that. And so, yeah, we're really, we're really putting a lot of resources into covering these elections, not just in the like horse race kind of coverage, but doing like deeper analysis. And that's what I want to get into with you today, because there's so much you've covered and some of your colleagues have covered on the BC Conservatives and the more recent news yesterday of EB backtracking on the carbon tax. But before we dive too deep into that, uh, people may have read online what the TAI is about, but that was probably uh, spin or partisan attacks on you. What What is the TAI actually about? We're an independent news magazine website um, that uh, David Beers, who was an editor at the Vancouver Sun and had a very long magazine freelance career before that. Um, he started the TIE in 2003. And he started it because at that time, you know, the BC Liberals had just sort of, I don't know if you, if people, I'm, I'm 46, so I remember all of this clearly, but not everyone might remember this. But in 2001, the BC Liberals, which are kind of more like a center right party in BC, a little bit different than the federal Liberals, had completely decimated the BC NDP at that time. In 2001, they'd come in and they'd um, formed government. And so Dave Beers kind of saw a, like a bit of a niche to like provide a more progressive news site that would kind of, you know, focus on progressive issues. He saw that that was kind of lacking in the BC media landscape. And that was back really far back in the internet age. There was no Facebook and people would email stories around. And I think they still do that, but it was, um, yeah, it was really before like people would share stories by, by social media. It's this crazy idea of having a new site that was um, only online. And we're still Yeah, I remember, I don't know if I started reading it that long ago, but I remember it had that kind of classic vintage era website up until only a few years ago when it finally modernized. But it's looking great and still doing, it's, it's Ouch. like, it, it was never <laughs> ugly, right? But it kind of had a more vintage <laughs> feel, but it's, it always worked. It got the news across and yeah, like, it's always been valuable to me. So I appreciate the work you and your yeah. colleagues do there. Yeah, we try to do like really gold standard journalism. So even though I say we're a progressive, we're a validly progressive news site, we do like really spend a lot of time trying to do like very, you know, thorough journalism, trying to get, you know, do like very fair and balanced reporting. Um, and we take, then we take the time. We're always the reporters at the time have the luxury of sort of like being able to do deep dives into topics, which is getting more and more unusual these days. So I want to start off on the deep dive you published back on September 9th, on, on September 9th, Russian disinformation, a Langley right-wing influencer and a BC conservative. And this piece covers a lot of ground. It kind of gets into the executive director of the BC conservatives. It gets into some of their candidates. It gets into, and I think where we need to start is this US DOJ indictment of tenant media. Um, and the Russian connection. Yeah, so can you, let's break this down to start. 
Oh, those Russians. Uh, yeah, this is a quite delicious story, interesting story, fascinating story that broke on September 4th. Um, the United States Department of Justice um, released this indictment and it showed or it, uh, alleged that these two Russian nationals um, who worked for Russia Today, which we know is sort of this Russia Today International is this kind of like uh, Russian propaganda news site that, you know, it has attracted a lot of contributors from various countries. Um, and so those two people who had been working at Russia Today were sort of secretly funding this YouTube channel media company called Tenet Media. And what Tenet Media had done was attract these six uh, right wing influencer kind of people, people who like go on YouTube and have a show and talk for two hours and people will listen to them or maybe have a podcast, um, do a lot of their work on social media. It's become really, really common in today's media landscape. Um, I'm sure everybody has friends or has, has watched this kind of content on, on either side of the political spectrum. Um, people sitting in front of a microphone on YouTube, um, bloviating or talking or whatever you want to say. Um, but what they found was that, yeah, these, uh, the, basically this money was coming basically from the Russian government essentially, and to the tune of $10 million to kind of set up this right-wing news channel. And one of the contributors for very interestingly to us in British Columbia was, is Lauren Southern. Um, she is this very far right um, influencer. Uh, she calls herself a journalist, but what she really dwells on is usually warning again and again about mass immigration, using like this really highly racialized language such that like mass immigration is going to replace certain populations. So, you know, she might do a video about um, immigration, you know, valid immigration concerns in a country like Ireland, but the way she talks about it is like these hordes of immigrants are coming and they're going to replace Ireland's population. So it's obviously, you know, not very subtle um, coding for um, people coming in with places. Well, and it's not even just your so, opinion. She has like faced legal consequences for yeah. this action. Back in yes. 2017, I remember this incident. She was uh, among a number of activists out in the Mediterranean trying to stop humanitarian ships from helping refugees. And I think she was alleged to have fired flares at them. And yeah, she was detained by the Italian Coast Guard. She was also barred from entering the UK in 2018. Uh, because she also is very anti-Islam, um, routinely talks about um, Muslim people in this way that's always highlighting like the worst qualities. Um, it's just, yeah, it's pretty clear what she's on about. Um, and so, but she lives in, she lives in BC. She's from BC. She had gotten this more international reputation, but after having a lot of consequences for that really extreme activity, she did kind of retreat back to BC um, and has written a lot about how she was kind of like unfairly persecuted and her life um, has kind of changed because of um, all of those consequences for her actions. But she gets attention in BC. Uh, you draw out that repeatedly executive director of the BC Conservatives, Angela Isidoro, uh, engaged with her on social media. Um, yeah, so... Um, when this Russian disinformation story broke, and we should take a moment to say that Lauren Southern and the other contributors are not charged with any crime. And the two um, founders of Tenant Media, Lauren Chen and Liam Donovan, Lauren Chen is also Canadian and is probably a friend of Lauren Southern's from everything we can see online. Um, they haven't been charged with a crime. The two Russian nationals have been charged in this indictment. And Lauren Southern and the contributors are all saying that they did not know that this operation was funded by Russian money and they've said that they, they were dupes. And yeah, they were just dupes, happy to get their $400,000 a month check uh, <laughs> and their $100,000 per video plus their signing bonus of $100,000 or at least one contributor got that much. I don't know that everyone did. Mm -hmm. They were just happy to get their checks and not really yeah, ask Lauren, where from. Lauren Southern actually says she didn't get paid as much, which is kind of interesting because she was the only woman um, in this group of six. So that's just kind of interesting little detail. But yeah, that's, it's just like crazy amounts of money that these people were being paid and they claim it was market value. There's really big questions about whether that's the case. Um, but yeah, I was really interested when I saw Warren Southern's name come up in this whole um, story because a few weeks before, you know, John Rustad and Kevin Falcon held their press conference where Kevin Falcon, the leader of BC United, just said, we're giving up, we're, 
we're folding our tent in and we're going to be not competing with the BC Conservatives. Um, before that, BC United had, of course, been doing opposition research on the Conservatives, and they had come up with the series of reply posts that Angela Isidoro, who's the executive director of the BC Conservative Party, had left on Lauren Southern's various Twitter posts. And so I had this, and I had been intending to kind of maybe do like a longer post, just for a longer story that was maybe more of a profile of Angela or something like that. But when I saw the connection to this national story, I just was like, I, I can't continue to sit on this. I feel like voter, voters need to know about this. So, so we've done this. Yeah. Story. And in his position is that he just interacts with lots of people. Interaction does not equate to endorsement. And you're just doing guilt by association. But what what was the substance of some of those comments? Because I think that matters more than just like, you know, we don't want to. I'm I don't at least want to uh, disparage someone because they liked a post, uh, which we've seen happen quite a bit. But he did more than that. Yeah, I agree. I don't. Yeah, I don't particularly like, and it's it's sort of like changed over time. I think um, I don't particularly like reporting that just hangs somebody out to dry because they liked a post. I feel like that's a little, people do likes in kind of the, the emotion of the moment. This was more than that. Um, this was like a lot of, a lot of replies that were like different kind of substance. Some of them were just very brief, but there's this one from 2023 that really caught my eye. And I think that this is, has some really interesting information in it. So I'll read out part of it. So he wrote, um, and this was in response to a post where Lauren Seven had really been complaining about all of the consequences that had happened to her after all of these legal consequences. And she was sort of talking about how it had led to a lot of struggles, personal struggles for her. Um, so she, he said, Lauren, you and I have only met on a few occasions, but you've been nothing but kind and generous. I'm so sorry to hear about what you've been through. Um, and then he says, um, I'm glad to hear you have faith, particularly because of your journey and the unjust persecution you have encountered. History is often written by the suffering and the martyred. And then he also says that he's watched her content for years. Um, and so, and we also have another post that's very inconsequential. It's just a very, like, we don't even know what he's really replying to because the post has been deleted, but that's from April, 2024. So we just know that in 20, you know, as early as, as recently as 2023 and 2024, he's still engaging with her and, the fact that he's been watching her content for years, I just kind of have questions, you know, obviously, like, why are you watching this content? I don't like, I've had to watch her videos for reporting on her. They don't make me feel great. They're and, frankly it's very, And it's very easy to explain <laughs> that, right? If you questions. have to do it for your job or, yeah. but. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, and I feel like we should, we should take a step back here and just note that Angelo has, you know, had a little bit of a long association with Lauren Southern back in 2019 when he was a university student at UBC. He was a member of this UBC Free Speech Club, and their whole thing was that they would invite these controversial speakers, some of them who were quite on the far right. And when there was uh, protests about having those speakers come, they would be, they would say, you know, our free speech is in danger here. And one of the people that they invited was Lauren Southern. Um, the talk up ultimately didn't end up going ahead. Um, so he has had, that's sort of where his interaction with her, I think, started. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the questions we had. Like what, what exactly, you know, it's possible that he was trying to bring her, um, out of sort of like an extremist point of view. That's, that was totally possible, but that's not what he said in his response to us, but he did make it clear that he really did not see this as an endorsement of her views. And it doesn't mean that he agrees with her views. So I just wanted to Yeah, he just make that happens to only ever really go to, and this is my opinion, uh, go to one side of the spectrum when he wants to highlight controversy uh, and bring on or read or follow or repeat or not repeat, but uh, I don't know, highlight a bit more those kind of views as opposed to. Well, what, the interesting thing that is one, one thing I realized about just looking into the UBC Free Speech Club and what there was a lot of reporting back then, especially by the UBC, the UBC student newspaper, which is really wonderful reporting. Um, the free speech club would always say, you know, they'd always point to the YouTuber ContraPoints, um, who's this quite famous, um, more left wing, um, YouTuber who was, who has actually credited with, um, bringing some people who had gone to this extremist ideology, like bringing them back, bringing them out of it. But the whole, I think that's a bit interesting because her whole 
strategy at that time anyway was to really kind of engage with and debate with these far right speakers. And so the fact that they had her is sort of like, I don't know, I just think that's interesting. Let's pause on <laughs> Angelo for another second. Post UBC Free Speech Club, I know he was involved in the NPA, Vancouver's Nonpartisan Association, the political party that was on the center right, and then it kind of drifted further right before it collapsed uh, in the last couple of years before the 2022 election. I think it's probably still around as some of these things, like Vision Vancouver is still technically around, I think, but it's largely been, I don't know, demolished by history. But he was involved there. And I know that when he was involved, Kennedy Stewart uh, claimed that he was one of the far right wing members who took over the board for which they tried unsuccessfully to sue him for defamation. Um, just lots of stuff keeps happening in his history, as it seems. Yeah, I think I think that we need to kind of place all of this in the context of um, especially like young men, the, the kind of media that's become very normalized. Now, a lot of this right wing media, Angelo has tried to kind of be a right wing media person himself. He had a um, he had a long running podcast on the post millennial, which is this right wing news site. Um, and he's also tried to, a few times, like you say, like kind of get involved in politics. Uh, he was also involved with the People's Party of Canada, Maxime Bernier's party, um, back in the sort of like 2018 election. Um, he ultimately ended up leaving that party and he complained about uh, racism there. And so that's why he says he left. Um, and he also, I also encountered him at a 2017, uh, when they're opening the Trump Hotel, there was a lot of anti-Trump protests. At that time, he showed up, he was very young, he was 20, and he showed up with a mega hat with a bunch of other young men also wearing mega hats. However, you know, since that time, after there was like things that happened, he's disavowed Trump, and he's said that Trump has become too extreme for him. So I just want to make that clear that he has, he has walked back, you know, from some of those associations. He's clearly still very, very interested and passionate about that. Yeah, so I guess the entire, it's hard to take any one thing away from this story. It's just like a bunch of interesting connections and suggestions about like the Russian influence or at least sponsorship, you know, secretly of right wing content that is being consumed by the people who are running this ascendant political movement that kind of came almost out of nowhere, like BC conservatives have existed for a long time, but it was such a fringe kind of simmering party where only a few people in rural northern BC would join it. Most people got involved in the BC Liberals and later United. And now they're contesting government and just don't know what to take away from that other than, you know, I'm personally concerned because I don't like that kind of content. And the policies they're going for but and it and i don't think it's fair to say that like russia is influencing bc's election directly either obviously right yeah no 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 we cannot we cannot say that we're just it was just uh because this was coming up and this was a huge story um it made sense to kind of take a deeper look at it at this time and to just ask you know there have been questions about who, like Russia was obviously involved in the 2016 election and trying to influence, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't all Russia. I have to make that very clear. Like not, this right wing media stuff, it's not all Russia. It's also partly coming from, you know, people being dissatisfied, people being angry. Um, so I don't want us to be like assuming that every single thing is, is like a nefarious plot by the Ruskies or something. This weird like Cold War kind of neo cold war thing that's that's going on that's that's not really the case but i do think it's worth sometimes when we see these this right wing media it looks very very popular and i think what this story has shown us is that there might be a reason why you know things are things are very slick uh taylor lawrence which is who's a tech journalist in the united states had a very good newsletter about this she's pointing out that you know the median salary for a journalist in the United States is like something like fifty-seven thousand dollars, and she's like, "Look at how much these right-wing media guys were being paid, like just hundreds of thousands of dollars per video." It was just the order of magnitude was just off the charts, and so she was really questioning, you know, like when we're trying to do our journalism 
some of these people, like Rachel Gilmore, who's a Canadian journalist in, in Canada, um, who has a day job at Check My Ads, which is this American organization. Um, she said that she does her journalism, which she mostly does on social media, and it's very good at what she does. But she's doing it kind of off the side of her desk. Like, here's someone doing like just amazing journalism and not actually really even getting paid for it. So just the contrast between that, like trying to do our responsible journalism and doing fact checking and how hard it is to get resources for that. I think that's kind of what I'm taking away from this is that, wow, there's just a lot of, like we're up against a really big media machine, whether or not it's funded by another foreign country, um, which the US is obviously very concerned about, or whether it's just, you know, people are just really into it in Canada. It's just very clear that a lot of people are are watching this content. Um, and we're kind of seeing it pop up in the in the BC campaign. We're seeing, you know, um, uh, John Rusta, the leader of the BC Conservatives, going on Jordan Peterson's show and um, agreeing on very, like, anti-science, climate change, denialism, talking points, for instance. Um, Jordan Peterson repeatedly bringing up very, like, transphobic things, like, oh, women are cutting off their breasts, for instance, they say. And then we're hearing like people at John Rosset's speech, speeches, like also using the same language, saying that they're concerned about women cutting off their breasts. And so, but we're also seeing like John Rosset having to occupy this really interesting kind of space where he is at times kind of pointing towards that stuff, but he's also like very good at staying on message and walking it back. So in his Jordan Peterson interview, you know, Jordan Peterson was trying to get him to say that the entire public school system is like, Marxist communist ideology and John Rustad is like not taking the bait and he's like also on some of the transgender issues John Rustad is not taking the bait and like saying like we need to support people and using that kind of language so it's a very but at the same time saying that he's going to like get rid of SOGI uh, the curriculum in school so it's like a it's like this fine line that all these politicians are walking we're also seeing this happen on the federal level. We're seeing Pierre Polyev, in some ways, when you actually look at his policies, they're kind of standard conservative free market policies. But he'll sprinkle in things to his speeches, like a reference to Jordan Peterson. He'll talk about uh, the World Economic Forum conspiracy theory. He'll sprinkle in like something about how mandatory vaccine policies are bad. So he's sort of like giving people that content that they're looking for. And they do react to it. They are like really into that content. So I just think we need to kind of look at the entire media ecosystem and realize that people Yeah, it's are, been interesting. I forget where I saw it, but this. someone did an analysis or showed some that suggested there's a lot more globalization of politics where there also there used to be a lot more like you focused on your local yeah. issues and what yes. was debated in BC would be different than what's debated in Virginia versus what's debated in the UK election. But with the growth of these like online influencers with global platforms the the issues end up being the same everywhere or at least from the right wing side especially yeah and, yeah you know a lot of that yeah you know, i was gonna say a yeah lot totally can come in from was, the funding of yeah, we're seeing, foreign governments but i think you know there are major corporations and major financial donors like you know billionaire elon musk is very open about how much he's eager to fund certain uh perspectives and ideologies and so it's not all just foreign money. I guess that's foreign to Canada. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And yeah, and we are seeing that really clearly in the BC election. I spoke to um, someone who had written kind of like this standard story about just the BC, BC elections, BC, um, introducing some new technology to help count votes. And it's just it's a very standard story. It's not that exciting. But all of the comments below the story were all about you know, fears of like um, voter fraud. And that's not really something you normally hear about in the Canadian election. It's very, very much something you hear about in American politics, as we know. But the fact that people are bringing up those fears um, when they don't really exist in Canada and have a very secure voting system um, just shows like how much, yeah, how much people are being influenced by, as you say, yeah, this global kind of right wing talking points. And I mean, I guess on the left too, I don't really know as much, but, um, but yeah, we're certainly seeing it on the right. And, and that includes like stuff about concern about immigration, which we haven't really seen come up as much in Canada, but I kind of expect that we will because it's very much 
it's very much in Europe and it's very much in Yeah, US. I think that's started to break through in the past couple of weeks, especially. And many of the stories around temporary foreign workers push on that. But let's how I mean, one of the other things that came up on the Tai was the conservative response to both your initial questions and then your story was toxic, <laughs> was unhelpful, let's say. Uh, Paul Wilcox, senior editor, put out a whole piece just like, sorry, BC Conservatives, uh, the tie isn't the story, uh, highlighting yeah. how some of the questions you and some yeah. of your colleagues have sent to them, instead of responding to them, they just screen capped them and tweeted them as though you were attacking them by just trying to get their side. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a tactic we're also seeing borrowed from American politics, where you attack the media and you try to discredit the media. Of course, journalists are sometimes not very well liked in society. Like we talk about sad things all the time and people get mad at us and we get rightly criticized when we're not being, when we're, when we're missing information or when we're not doing the work to tell the whole story. And that's totally valid and journalism should be criticized because that's how we get better. Um, but what we have seen from the United States is obviously this very, very like targeted, um, yeah, like really, really targeting the media in a kind of very nasty way. Um, the media pen at Trump's rallies where they like point at the media. It's very nasty stuff. Uh, we're seeing Pierre Polyev also adopt these tactics and really like needle journalists during press conferences. You know, he's being asked about actual policy and he's choosing to kind of just pick on journalists from certain outlets. Um, Canadian press is one of the ones that comes to mind. He's really been on this kick about how Canadian press doesn't like him. Um, they're a wire service. They're very, you know, pretty conservative media organization in terms of the journalism they produce. So it's a bit odd, but that kind of illustrates just the tactics that they've taken. So that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing this conservatives, the BC conservatives take the same kind of line. And they're just kind of like lashing out and saying, like, this is, this is bad journalism. This is tabloid journalism. And in some, some candidates have gone a little farther. I think one of them accused us of trying to destroy the Western family unit. So it's just this language that's getting a little heated. And, um, yeah, my editor just wanted to write a column just sort of pointing out. I mean, that's one thing I've always appreciated about the TAI is in addition to the journalism, there are some columns there that, break the mold of what I would otherwise read in the National Post or the Globe and Mail or Vancouver Sun. And so it's not all like hard, well done journalism. And that's not just, it's based on that. Some of the opinion columns uh, add some color, let's say, in a good way. Yeah. Yeah. We do have some, I mean, I think that's in the, we, we're kind of, we don't stray from the newspaper tradition. Newspapers have always had columnists and editors writing columns. Um, and we have a really great, um, some really great columnists and our, our readers really enjoy that content. Um, opinion writing always kind of, I don't know, I think people like to read stuff that accords with their views. Um, I, I love columns, but I, as a journalist, I kind of like to do the other reporting where I'm kind of like, you know, challenging people's views a little bit and, and also like introducing them to some, to some ideas that they, maybe would have rejected or something. So yeah, I think there's room, there's room for both and both are like important for a strong, a strong like news. Mm -hmm. And the other big story in provincial and a little bit on the federal side too this week was the NDP's perceived shift on the carbon tax. I think this started with a globe headline that said Jugmeet Singh and the federal NDP have said they will cut the carbon tax. They don't support it anymore. That was later updated to say they don't support the liberal form of the carbon pricing scheme uh, and would seek to reform it if they formed government. Uh, this was followed by David Eby announcing that if the federal backs carbon backstop ends, the one that requires each province to have a carbon pricing scheme, and if you don't, the federal one kicks in. Uh, if that goes away, BC will no longer have a consumer-facing carbon tax. Uh, both the Federal NDP and David Eby also clarified that they'll keep some kind of stronger industry-based carbon tax that consumers won't see at the pumps. But in both cases, it was seen as a big walk back from like climate pledges they've been making. Like BC has had a carbon price since 2008 when Gordon Campbell brought it in from the BC Liberals. Uh, the NDP initially yes, campaigned yeah, against it and lost an election mm -hmm. badly. 
when they went axe the tax. Uh, mm-hmm. And now uh, Carol James must be rolling over that her campaign would have had traction in 2024, I guess. Yeah, I think what we're seeing, so there's a couple of things going on here, I think. Um, the inflation has just been crazy and grocery prices are high and gas prices are high and housing prices are high. And I think that's the one that if that's the one issue that voters are really looking for answers on, that that would be the one. Like just having having your grocery price double is like enough to just send anyone over the edge and Canadian consumers and, and voters are just they're just gonna be looking for like an answer, like why the hell is this happening? How are you gonna make it better? And so when you're and then we've also I think we've also seen some of these parties being pushed a little bit maybe toward the, the conservatives um line of talking point. We've seen this happen with harm reduction as well. We've seen like, you know, the BC government just removed a bunch of harm reduction supplies from vending machines after a BC conservative did this sort of viral video about, oh my God, there's clean needles being given out in front of this hospital. Um so I think that we're seeing both those things there. And yeah, the NDP, like really, the federal, the federal NDP is really, really focusing on how to get grocery prices down. And then like gas prices would be like another kind of little part of that affordability. So, but it does, I just question, you know, in BC, it's a little bit of a different reality. The federal, the federal carbon tax is relatively new. It was introduced by the federal liberals under Justin Trudeau. But in BC, we have this long tradition of yeah, being the first province to have this carbon tax, a lot of like conservative economists at the time really supported it. Um, and it's sort of like seen as this very responsible economic way of just influencing behavior and getting us to lower our GHG emissions. So for us to promise, for like these, for the, for David Eby to promise to roll it back, I think is kind of a psychological blow. I mean, maybe to people who thought that maybe he wouldn't think of BC as being a leader. In climate action, and so yeah, I just question how that's all going to play out. It was a very weird time. announcement. I saw, I think it was Rob Shaw tweeting out that yeah. members of his caucus were only learning that he was going to make that announcement like an hour before. So it seems like it was a kind of rash decision made by EB, maybe his core advisors alone, uh, and very reactive. Which, mm. Yeah, you have to wonder what they're hearing on the doorstep and in their internal polling, like whether this, I think when we talk about like just how the conservative message has really been effective this election cycle, I think in getting through the people and resonating with people, I think that's, I think that maybe. Yeah, I know I've been seeing a ton of the NDP's John Rust ads, a career politician ads on uh, like CBC Gem, half of my ads are that. NDP one, they're either like very clearly targeting me or uh, just CBC Gem doesn't get that many ads. I've seen it in a few other places. So they're putting a lot of money behind that in the pre writ period. Uh, it's, I guess we'll have to see what they actually come out positively. But it's so weird for me to see a government that was, you know, a few months ago coasting to election just like flailing almost, like they're reacting so rashly and almost arbitrarily to the opposition like you said they flipped on the harm reduction supplies they flipped on decrim uh they're just basically taking the leads from the conservative talking points and it outside of housing i don't know what they actually stand firm on that's what yeah that's how it feels to me that um and I don't know, maybe not as much on the federal side, but it, it definitely feels like on the federal side too, like, you know, Jagmeet Singh is like also being, it just feels like he's being, some of like, some of his normal talking points that would resonate with people on affordability are also being um, really pushed hard by the federal conservatives and are really resonating with people. So it's like, how do you kind of, you're, they're both trying to be, I guess, a little bit populist on that, on that point, although... I do think those inflation fears and, and consequences are very, very real for people. It shouldn't all be dismissed as populism. But you see them both trying to carve out space on that affordability spectrum. And it seems like the things, yeah, the conservatives both federally and provincially have been a little bit more successful in, you know, it's also just like a change, you know, people wanting change. The incumbent parties who have been around, who were around during the COVID pandemic just have an incredibly hard 
um, place to keep because they you can pin all of these consequences of the pandemic right on them when it really you know this inflation happened across the country no matter who was in power. So yeah. Yeah, I know yeah, even on this consumer facing well. carbon tax, Sonia First now had an interview a few weeks ago in uh, I think it was in Kelowna where she kind of said the same things like the consumer facing carbon tax is you know putting too much on working people's backs if we were elected we'd reform it we'd we'd listen to all the de- these different concerns and we'd make it better and she was vague about how but even the green party had this kind of it's clear what's what we are doing is not working and like federally they basically take all the money they collect from the carbon tax and send it in rebate checks four times a year into people's uh, bank accounts. And people don't always realize because sometimes they're already getting the GST rebate. BC's initial carbon tax was entirely offset by income tax cuts. And since the NDP came in, the carbon tax has gone up and they've you know, kept a lot of those income tax cuts. They've also added a rebate check and then some of it goes into general revenue. So if we lost the carbon tax on the consumer side, there's suddenly another hole in our budget that we would need to figure out if we're going to re-increase income taxes, which I suspect would be quite unpopular, or find a different way, or just increase the budget, uh, the deficit again, which they had some bad news last week on. Yeah, yeah, they're also vulnerable on that deficit. It's very large. Um, yeah, and then just even on the climate change impact side, like, yes, I know people were, are really worried about inflation and rising costs, but at the same time, you know, people are also still seeing, you know, raging wildfires. They remember the floods of 2021, you know, the deadly heat dome. Like, it's clear that climate change is also just very viscerally impacting us here in British Columbia. So, um, yeah, I do question whether voters are also going to be wanting to know, like, okay, if you're taking away the climate, you know, carbon tax, what is your goal on climate change? Um, it feels to me like there's just people, politicians might be sort of giving up a little bit on the idea of being able to reduce GHG emissions or that that's useful, um, which really feels concerning to me because... Yeah, as much as people are worried about how much grocery, the cost of groceries in stores, um, climate change also affects the price of things as well. So, I think, like, BC does have a record to go on, both under the NDP and the Liberals before them, on climate action, right? The Clean BC plan meant there are critics of it, but it is more than most provinces are doing. And the federal government has a bit of those other programs, but I guess they're just not as flashy like subsidies for heat pumps and e-bikes are great, but people aren't remembering them as actually making the difference that they do versus the carbon taxes. I guess you see it at the pump every day. I think one of the challenges BC has had is the carbon tax has definitely helped. But if you look at our GHG emissions, they've mostly been flat. And so the government can argue, you know, we're decreasing them per capita and that's good, but we need absolute reductions. And so we haven't seen as big of reductions as we've needed to. And it's one of those situations, again, where I think the half measure almost did more harm than not doing anything, because now there is opposition to doing the things we need to do, but we never did them hard enough to actually make a result. So even the supporters can't really defend it. It's like some of the challenges they've had with safe supply, where only a handful of people are actually accessing these alternatives that save them from the toxic drug crisis. But John Rustad and Pierre Polyev are running around saying everyone's getting free drugs in BC, which is just factually inaccurate. Yeah, yeah. And I think that, you know, it's interesting, the carbon tax in BC was not, I don't think it was really even something that was on voters' minds a lot until Pierre Polyev, like, you know, quite brilliantly uh, has this like political messaging to ax the tax and it's just it's been very effective and so yeah there again i think that's where you see sort of federal politics driving provincial politics i just feel like if eb or sing want to ax the tax it makes no sense to me why they came out this way and didn't present an alternative first because now they have both just sounded like they're following the other guys and if people are voting on axing the tax they're going to vote for the 
people who clearly will, as opposed to David E. Bue's like, well, I might do it if the feds cancel it. Yeah, I really feel like the NDP in BC might be um, kind of maybe following a little bit of the same path as the NDP in Alberta in the last election when Rachel Notley kind of campaigned on trying to, it seemed like they were trying to capture the more centrist voters and they were seem to be really afraid of looking too left wing or too progressive. Um, and then after they lost that election to Daniel Smith of the United Conservative Party, um, Notley and the campaign got a lot of criticism from progressives of like not, not presenting like a really inspiring progressive, um, campaign that people could really get behind and get excited about. And so I just wonder if that might be happening a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I know so, having so. grown up in Alberta, it's a very hostile territory for anyone not carrying a blue banner, uh, historically. There's 60, 70% of people are going to vote conservative in that province. And so the 2015 Notley win was the fluke of the perfectly split right. BC has been a little bit different, but like historic, if you go back to David, Dave Barrett's 72 win, they get 42, 44% of the vote in almost every election. There's a couple they went lower and there's one they went higher. That's what they're polling at right now. And so I, I kind of... Yeah, yeah. And in 2017, they, you know, they were only able to form government by making that alliance with the Greens. Like it's, it's even when people want change, like in 2017, people were like, we're ready for change. You know, we talk about those change elections, like in 2015, federally, people finally voted out Stephen Harper because they wanted change and they were pushed out. And we see a lot of energy in those kind of change elections. Um, yeah, but even in BC, like in 2017, like I was saying, like when people really want, were convinced that yes, they wanted to get rid of the BC Liberals finally after 16 years of government, um, the NDP still had a hard time you know, it was a great result for them, but they still had to like go to the Greens and kind of make the make the case like, yes, we can make this government. So it's going to be, it's definitely not a cakewalk for for the NDP this election. Like people do seem to be quite jazzed. So we'll keep an eye on them for the next few weeks. The campaign actually hasn't officially started yet. It doesn't officially start until the 21st, but then it's a kind of very rushed four weeks until mid-October when we vote. But you have a lot of work to do. What kind of things will you be covering and looking at for the tie? Well, there's so much. Um, yeah, our team is uh, really interested in the carbon tax um, turnaround. So I think we'll probably be doing something more there. I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff to cover, like on the forestry side. We've had some wonderful reporting about, you know, we hear we hear this from John Mustad a lot that BC is running, you know, it doesn't have enough fiber and we hear this from the forestry industry. We just had a wonderful deep dive into that, into why, why is BC running out of trees? Um, we've also looked into claims, is BC running out of electricity? I don't know, we're just running out of everything. Um, we've done a lot of fact checks. I think that the attacks on, you know, um, SOGI, the SOGI policies in schools, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, identity policies, which are meant to prevent bullying of trans and LGBTQ plus students. I think those are really top of mind for us and sort of like the little, you know, what advocates have said are pretty transphobic comments sprinkled frequently throughout, you know, BC conservative messaging. Um, those are, I think those are, that's a real focus for us as well. So um, yeah, and just, you know, just, and continuing to look into the right wing media sphere and how it's, how it's kind of like changing politics on the ground is also like just continues to be Wonderful. You. Thank you so much for sitting in this week. Besides the Taiyi, are you still active on social media? Is there anywhere people should follow you? Yeah, I'm still on Twitter, which is now known as X. I don't like it there very much, but I still have to be there. So you can follow me there at Jen St. Dan. But I'm also on Instagram and threads. So it's at Jen St. Dennis. Dennis with one in, like the student of Montreal. Um, I sort of prefer hanging out there these days, but stuff still continues to happen on Twitter. So yeah, I'm All right, All thank right, you so much. And that has been Play Toast. Find links to everything we talked about at playtoast.ca. Support the show and get access to our Slack channel at patreon.com slash playtoast. Our intro music credit is Beautiful British Columbia by Serge Plotnikoff. Play Toast is a production of Legend Boot Media and editing services are provided by CHLY 101.7 FM in Nanaimo. Thanks for listening. Thank you.